Our plans for this session is to just start by having each of you turn to someone you're sitting next to and just sort of share any experiences you've had around backlash. Um, and then we'll get a couple of those in the room. And then Lynn and I are both going to share through a case study our framework approaches and method for responding to back backlash. And what we're hoping to leave you with is on the one hand content that you can use in responding to false um, accusations of anti-Semitism, and then also the components of organizing a response to backlash. Um, so that's what we're hoping to leave you with. If we have time, we'll also take some of um, your cases and work on them together, but we're hoping through presenting two cases in depth that that'll give you um, something to apply to your own experiences. Um, so if people could start by just turning to someone next to you and just, we'll take maybe two and a half minutes each and we'll tell you when you should be wrapping up so the next person can share, just, um, um, an experience or an example or just a place where you really struggled with backlash you experienced or feeling accused of something, um, particularly a false claim of anti-Semitism. So, whoever finds someone next to you. Because it is so new. Um, last Sunday, I found out I was going to be on the next flotilla. And I You're really what? I was going to be on the next flotilla in the uh, City of Hope. Uh -huh. Super excited, and within a week, less than a week, I've been compared to Hitler three different times. Mm -hmm. And it's crashing, and I'm shocked to hear it, or shocked where it's thinking, okay, these are folks who know me. I mean, where, what are folks who do not really know me while are doing things? Or mm -hmm. had a huge amount of people delete me from Facebook because of postings regarding the flotilla in Gaza. So I kind of coming here to seek guidance on a revival, basically. Sorry that you're experiencing that. Another? Yeah, uh, yeah, back in 82, I was in medical school at University of Washington, and Israel invaded Lebanon then, and I wrote in my medical school newspaper an article, In Defense of Palestinian Rights, and immediately there were many people in my class that distanced themselves from me, and the head of family practice department called me an anti-Semite, mm -hmm. and I went into his office. I didn't even know him at the time, looking straight in the eye and said, it's not about anti-Semitism, it's about human rights. And after that, he backed down. We had a little bit of a cordial but cold relationship, but we at least mm -hmm. couldn't use that. But still, it, it, there were many classmates uh, that were either Jewish or Christian Zionist in their outlook who uh, all of us, we were the best of friends, and all of a sudden we weren't. So the cost of relationships and personal as well as more acquaintance relationships. Right. One more. Yeah. Um, I, this is not something I personally experienced as an organization, which the three of us belong to, um, called Kadima Reconstructionist Community in Seattle. Um, it is a, and it's a congregation, but it's found, one of its founding platforms was a two-state solution over 35 years ago. So we had um, Naim Atik, who is the founder and head of Sabil, um, come speak, we had him planning to come speak to our, come to a service and come speak to our group after our Shabbat service. And um, the Feder Jewish Federation sent us a letter basically saying we were stupid and being duped and sort of threatening to ostracize us. Threatening. Very threatening. <coughs> threatening to ostracize us from the Jewish community and saying that um, he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. What else can they say? You're engaging in a pretense of bridge building. Oh, yeah. A pre pretense. We're engaging in a pretense of bridge building. Mm -hmm. um, With a hidden agenda. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, what we did is rather than being reactive, we, um, our board met and we took a while to craft a response to them that basically pointed at, I mean, it was really um, adult and I don't know, I think kind of showed how pathetic they were. Mm -hmm. And um, we did 
have Naima to come and speak to us. It was mm -hmm. lovely. So, and we were the uh, we, we were the first and only Jewish um, congregation to ever invite him and not renege mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. because of the pressure. So, I mean, so the way we combated it was to just be really, you know, firm and calm and Torah-based. Torah-based. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Um, and which just, you know, the contrast was so striking how, and they actually did um, apologize and say that we're not in the business of trying to No, they control. said that their record was used in it. Oh yeah, they, they made a lot of excuses, but they also said we're not in the business of controlling what people are, you know, can hear, and uh -huh. anyway, so. Great, so you kind of stood on your principles and moved forward with your work. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, those are, I think, some pretty common examples that people experience of backlash. Personal attacks are pretty um, common and often because there's not a lot of content that the argument can be won on, mm -hmm. it does actually resort to personal attacks. Um, we were just talking about something called the shit list, which is self, which is a self-hating is really threatening Jews. And it's such a broad range of politics, but the almost everything on there, there's almost no content about what people do, and there's like 2,700, I mean, there's a huge number of people on that, and it's almost all personal attacks. Mm -hmm. So that's one, tech, that's one strategy. Um, uh, another is this, um, for people who are Jewish and take a stance, kind of ostracization, or we sometimes get, in addition to self-hating Jews, people of Jewish descent, like a way of trying to delegitimize <laughs> our experience or um, uh, ancestry. Um, and then um, uh, some of the harder stuff, though, is the impact it can have on our personal relationships or organizational relationships that we care about. Sometimes, you know, a lot of times the people who are attacking us, it's almost like a sign of honor. It's like, if you are attacking me, then I'm doing something right. But, um, but there are then people who we lose or feel tension with, who we love or care about or have professional relationships with or personal relationships with. And then there's some of the more serious things that we'll be talking more about, which are attempts to actually stop our work or organizing, organized attempts to mobilize people against the work that we're doing. Um, uh, people who stand up and work with us, particularly community-based organizations, may have their funding threatened, which means then um, the services they provide to community can get threatening, can get threatened, which then becomes a way to try to pit communities against the Palestinian struggle, because the framework on it is that um, uh, the Palestinian struggle has nothing to do with what the community needs, and, and because of that, something's being taken from the community. Um, there's also threats to safety that can happen. I don't know how many people have experienced that. Um, and then more recently, um, there's ways in which um, uh, organizations, particularly who support and spend their time organizing in support of Israel, are part of surveillance and attacks, um, uh, legal attacks on people who do this work. Um, and so those are the, those are the different forms um, of backlash. Um, and the good news about that is that that's not new forms of backlash for most movements, and movements have survived and often won despite those forms of backlash. But they are things that we contend with, and we want to be not only as strategic in how we survive those and don't allow them to divide us or be used against us, but also um, beyond that, figuring out ways that we can actually use it to our advantage in the way that you described doing. So, um, what we'd like to do now is, um, uh, Lynn is going to share a little bit about her framework and approach and use the Olympia BDS um, uh, co-op boycott as an example um, of how to respond to backlash, and then I will give a different case. So, do you want to? Sure. Okay. Salam alaikum. Shalom alaikum. Peace be with you. Hi, hi, everybody. Um, so, 
I, I first want to say that, you know, as somebody who's been doing this work for 44 years, I'm still here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to reassure you that it is possible to be radical edge. Because I was just thinking about Kajima when it was part of New Jewish Agenda. And, um, and I, I met your community. So the first thing I want to say in terms of strategy, long haul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> long haul. The long haul. And um, so that, that's one thing to think about. So when, when um, I, who, who here is from Olympia? Congratulations. Uh, when the um, res when the co-op passed, the BDS uh, the BDS um, resolution and decided to deshell products, everybody was taken by surprise. I mean, I think people didn't really think that that it was going to happen, and so I was flown in um, as supportive rabbi type, and um, and uh, I made a YouTube video, which you can see supporting the BDS co-op, sitting in front of a of a farm of a of a gate to a garden, because on my community, anyway. I'm going to go through some of the pieces that um, happened and, and the framework for responding. Um, so I'm not going to outline the whole history, but just speak to the accusations, some of which you mentioned, and then how, how a framework was created around that. And I have to say that being at this conference uh, especially hearing um, Dahlia from uh, from Berkeley and the strategy the strategy that people are using these days because everybody faces this uh, accusation mm -hmm. it's just really heartwarming to and, and and inspiring to hear what a crisp sense of organizing mm -hmm. is is going on around this issue mm -hmm. so um, so first of all. They, the, the opposition um, is very well funded, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, the David Project, Campus Watch, Federation, Jewish Federations, uh, Christian Zionist groups. Um, stand uh, with uh, us. Stand with us. Uh, stand, stand with us. Uh, stands with us. <laughs> so there's this whole array of groups that come that come in from the outside and have their own. Um, method, as you outline some of them, their own method for delegitimization. Mm -hmm. One is that this is not that you're not taking a balanced approach. Uh -huh. So, in addressing, you're not taking a balanced approach. The response to that was um, to have an external standard to evaluate uh, the conflict, like what is the overall framework for looking at the conflict. And the overall framework for looking at the conflict is one of structural violence, structural violence, in which uh, a group is targeted due to identity and denied certain privileges and human rights. The external standard is human rights and international law. And um, that is very helpful to have the right frame for this conflict, uh, which is, it's, this is a, about structural violence and conflict transformation. That is not about conflict resolution. They're, these are not equal sides that need to just talk to each other. This is an imbalance where power and privilege is on one side, and so knowing which side you're standing on. It is the context of a solidarity framework. That's the other thing. And, and uh, Olympia, the organi organizers of BDS were very clear about what is a solidarity framework and, and what does it mean to be in solidarity. So knowing those things and, and having them in your vocabulary to speak to, I think, is, is really uh, very important. Uh, another, another piece was, this unfairly targets Israel. What about Darfur? 
oh my God, how many times have you heard that? <laughs> what about that for? Um, I think you can probably answer that yourselves. You know, talking about Darfur is one thing, and talk, talking about Israel is another thing, um, and Palestine. But the, what we did then is to say, why is this our issue? This is our issue because our tax dollars mm -hmm. and all that goes into um, the misuse of, of American tax dollars and uh, the fact that we're breaking our own treaties and having all of that language so that um, that can be a part of uh, your response. Uh, the next one, you're threatened with isolation and exclusion. We'll never talk to you again, you know, and um, you'll end up on the shit list. Um, who are your allies? Solidarity work means knowing who your allies are and being able to draw all the allies together at any given time so that you are not isolated. So that, that requires groundwork um, and why coalition building and networking in your local community is so important. Know also that you have, there's so many resources out there, so many from U.S. campaign you can follow. You can follow. Um, if you need Muslim, Jewish, Christian, secular, any, whatever, wherever you're going um, and doing, you have to be in really good touch with your allies because people have already handled this. This is not, nothing new, so draw on the wisdom that's already there. Um, what is your media strategy? Before you engage, do you have a media strategy? Do you have talking points for your issues? Do you have a script? Learn, you can, there's so many case studies you can draw on, so have a media strategy, develop a media strategy, and um, be able to articulate your side. That means, as, as everybody said, it's the importance of research is really important. Um, if people are saying you don't know enough, call on your Palestinian allies. They know what's going on. Um, they can speak to that. Uh, another one is Israel's not your country, you know, and you don't live there. That's back to the tax dollars and the fact that we're funding it. And also, come on, Israel is a holy land for Jews, Muslims, and Christians. Anyone who is identified as a Christian or a Muslim has every much right as a Jewish person to have a relationship there. And um, Muslims in the United States um, are also have a very hard time getting into Israel and visiting their own holy places because of this conflict. This was very interesting in the BDS here because all the charges of anti-Semitism, in fact, when we looked at who was calling in, actually, and, and making charges out of, uh, I'm going to say about a thousand phone calls or something like that, eight were what one might consider anti-Semitic, that is, the Jews own the media, the Jews run the world, it's Jewish bankers, it's Jewish money. When you hear those things, then Jewish antennas go boop, like that, but um, actually, what was going on was unbelievable amounts of Islamophobia. <coughs> Huge amounts of Islamophobia. So one response to this is to work with Muslim allies from CARE, for instance, C-A-I-R, and get the script down of what Islamophobia looks like. Um, and, uh, and again, a lot of these, these resources are online. Uh, another Another piece, this was a really big one that everybody always talks about, in particular Jewish people, you know, Jewish people are often driving this, um, is this makes me feel unsafe in my community. Oh my God. Um, so for one thing, a lot of Jewish people feel unsafe in their own communities because they can't talk about Israel openly. They can't, they can't share their anti-occupation mm -hmm. politics. Uh, but the question is back to solidarity work and um, who, who is actually dying? Who is being removed from their land? Who is under blockade? All of the points of occupation 
are are brought back again. This is not, you know, are have there been any attacks against Jewish people? Really, um, you have to deal with the unsafe piece by going back to, I believe, going back to um, the issue at hand. And again, who are your allies, and and how do you speak to this? As far as um, uh, as far as your own personal journey, and I'll, I'll stop here, uh, because a lot of people here were also unprepared for the emotional energy mm -hmm. that it takes to do this work long haul. And I think that if you are a person of privilege, meaning if you are a white American, um, we, we white Americans are used to certain entitlements. We don't have to think about a lot of what we do in the world. You know, we can go into a store, nobody's going to track us um, in the store. We can, we, we make so many assumptions based on our privilege. So when you're in solidarity, all of a sudden, you will start to experience, and believe me, of course, I'm not trying to make any claim that what you're experiencing is anything like what Palestinians are experiencing on the ground. Don't get me wrong. But you will get blowback from this. So it's really helpful when you take a stand and you're thinking about taking stands and you're thinking about doing the work to look at issues of privilege and to do your own homework, your emotional homework, um, to get smaller solidarity groups together and work out, out some of these things together, um, and to know that um, you don't have to be friends with everybody. Mm -hmm. You really don't, do not have to be friends with everybody. And um, solidarity will, will create a whole other kind of community. And that is that will end up being, I believe, the community that um, sustains you and takes you through it. And so, privileging Palestinian voices, working on solidarity, having the right framework for the conflict, having a media strategy, doing the groundwork around, um, around Islamophobia. Um, all of these pieces are how to combat the charge of anti-Semitism. When is anti-Semitism real? Um, that is um, really another story. And there's also plenty of information online. I'm sure Sarah can give you something uh, that, that works with that. And when anti-Semitism is real, um, when, if anti-Semitism were real here, Jewish people would not be in, in the position of, of privilege and power that they are in the United States. And, and it is true that Jews do feel vulnerable, mm -hmm. but that is our homework. Mm -hmm. That's our homework. We have to do that. Mm -hmm. And um, it cannot stand in the way of doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. That's our, our, our cross to bear. We, <laughs> we, we have to overcome that. And the way, partly the way we overcome that is by being in, in relate, good relationship with allies. That is how we get through. So, um, thanks. Hopefully that was, will help you all. I have no idea. <laughs> do people have immediate questions for Lynn before we do another case study? I see two, three, okay. Yeah, I, just, I have kind of a comment slash question. So I, I was uh, a member of LABBDS during this campaign and I, <clears throat> so one of the questions I wanted to ask was, um, I think that one of the things we, we underestimated was the potency of some of the arguments uh, that are framed intentionally in terms of progressive politics. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, some of those aren't as relevant to this discussion. I mean, they range from kind of promoting dialogue to, mm -hmm. you know, promoting quote unquote democracy, for example, by having more stringent rules for how you uh, institute a boycott mm -hmm. at, at a co-op. 
Uh, but I guess more relevant to this discussion is the way in which um, a lot of the language was couched in, uh, like Fawn mentioned at this last panel, in the kind of language of anti-oppression. Mm -hmm. uh, and that you know, the Jews in the community feel unsafe, and so on and so forth, and that people need to be allies to them. And, uh, I wonder if maybe in the course of this workshop, uh, mm -hmm. one or both of you could speak to um, kind of how to uh, debunk those arguments uh, on their own terms a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, how to use uh, some of the elements of the kind of anti-oppression framework uh -huh. uh, to, to speak to those arguments. Yeah. Okay. Did you, and then we'll come around. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little bit, I don't know how to frame it because I feel like I'm a, kind of outside of the community. Um, and so I, I don't know if my question is relevant to this conversation, even though it's bringing up everything that I've been thinking about. Um, so I think I, I have this issue around Judaism and being a culture slash a religion. And I don't know what it is, or it's probably both, but then it's also veiled in whiteness, right? And so, I don't, I don't know where I belong because my family is Jewish and lives in Israel, and, and I've never had a place in this country with it. Uh, I've always been the one who was ignored as people are walking, uh, you know, like during, during holidays, you know, uh, it's always like everybody else walking by and I just kind of would have a habit of like, watch, they're going to walk past me and go straight to the white folks and, you know, tell them about my life and satyrs and blah, blah, blah. And, Come to Seattle. Well, I live in Seattle now. So come to Well, it's okay. Actually, I, please just my, say. Yeah, yeah. My, my point is being in your work, um, or in this work, you're talking about anti-oppression. Where, where is that line of like between, you know, of, of identifying, because, you know, when I see there's like this thing of passing, right? Like you're white, you're Jewish, and is that your religion, or is that your cultural background? And then, and then the work, and so then being taken seriously and really understanding oppression and really understanding anti-oppression. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm not quite sure how to frame what I'm trying to say, but something like that when we say in solidarity, there really has to be a sense of, um, I feel like identification, obviously with compassion, we all, we all can identify from a place of, of compassion, but um, really identifying with what, uh, what the struggle is. Um, maybe maybe it'll, it'll clarify, but it's all wrapped up. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I mean, it was very clear. I, I, I think that um, white privilege is damaging on so many levels, and it's and, and the Jewish community is, the, the white Jewish community is incredibly guilty of it. <coughs> yep. And Sarah, Sarah can say more, so uh, thank you. Yes, absolutely, you're spot on. And I feel like these are some bigger questions, yeah. so if it's okay, we can hold on yeah. them, but I think your question um, is really important in terms of a framework of anti-racism and how central that is to this and that that's true inside of the Jewish community as well as how the Jewish community relates to other um, communities and then how we understand Zionism and its impact in, on not just Palestinians but also um, Jewish communities. And then you had something. Um, I just wanted to know sort of specifics, Lynn, when your rabbinic quick response team came in to, um, right. to Olympia, what was the interaction with the rabbinic community here? And you know, how did you deal with what they were doing? Or oh God, I had, first of all, I, I reached out to Johanna, yeah. um, who's a woman rabbi. She actually doesn't have a congregation yeah. in Olympia. But yeah. We had 10 email exchanges. Uh -huh. And yeah. And, and I kept, of course, very civil and tried to continually stay on point yeah, yeah, yeah. and have these conversations, you know, I mean, just re re rebut, but also yeah. uh, um, also explain boycott a little bit more, gave her a history of boycott and why boycott itself is not anti-Semitic, it's actually a tool in nonviolent struggle and why it's such a fabulous tool 
and how it came out of Samud and Intifada. I mean, I gave her a little. Um, I went to visit Seth face to face. Um, I did a workshop with um, sort of Hillel, with, with Jewish solidarity and Hillel types together. Um, public presence. I mean, you know, and then strategizing. It was it was a whole package of diplomatic of civilian diplomacy, but also never backing down or backing away. Mm -hmm. So we want to keep it to questions that are really specific to the Olympia boycott and action around that, and then we'll have a bigger discussion and address some of these bigger questions at the end. So are there specific questions for the response to the Olympia boycott? I have yeah. one for clarity, and that is, I assume that you got the stores to take things off the shelf that were uh, made in Israel, but that you did not ask them to remove the U.S. made matzo meal and those things. Is that correct? Well, the call, the boycott is specifically well, for Israeli goods. That, but I was just curious as to what was removed from the shelf. I'm not sure they call it carries. Uh, what you're referring to, but but the Israeli products were removed from the shelves. Which is what the there were six products deshelved, six, and one product actually was left on the shelf, and that was peace oil. So it was not even a full boycott; um, it was a partial boycott. In that there was one product called peace oil made by Jewish and Palestinian partners that was left on the shelf. Mm -hmm. The kosher products are still on the shelf. Yeah, that's a bit way to put it. Kosher U.S. made products are made in other than Israel. Okay. Okay. So sorry. Can we just have a point of clarification? Um, so this is a great this is a great place just to clarify that the, that 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 part of what is so important in our work is not allowing, and this sort of gets into the framework for how we do strategic defense. <laughs> So I'll get more into it, but um, uh, the Israel is a nation state, and um, the support behind Israel, which I will name as uh, Zionism, is a political movement. And when we oppose either the state of Israel or this or Zionism as a political movement or a political ideology, like we would oppose. Apartheid as a political ideology and the South African government as a political, uh, as a government, um, that is completely distinct from Jewish history, Jewish communities, Jewish culture, Jewish religion. And in fact, it is only Zionists who confuse Zionism and the state of Israel with Judaism what it means to be Jewish and Jewishness. So, um, you know, or, or others because of the way that Israel and Zionism has done that. So when there's a call for a boycott of Israeli products, that's a call for a boycott of things made <coughs> in a nation state called Israel. Right. All the other products you're talking about have to do with practices or products used by Jewish, some parts of the Jewish community for Jewish rituals or for Jewish culture, um, cultural um, practices or for Jewish food. Um, that has absolutely nothing to do that's what I with the call for boycott, um, divestment, and sanctions from the state of Israel. So that's, that's a, it's a great question because those are the exact distinctions we have to keep making and being really clear about, and 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 what we get back are um, uh, that's exactly what what we get accused of, which has nothing to do with the boycott. The boycott for divestment sanction um, for boycott divestment. The call for boycott divestment sanctions is a call against the state of Israel. So now it sounds it sounds very clear, and we have to be very clear. But of course. They muddled it into Well, the they is also us. <laughs> you know? So um, there, there are in our community, in the Jewish community, lots of varieties 
of people's relationship to Israel, which is a spiritual relationship. Um, so I, I would just, there are many frameworks to understand it, and we, which is why I try to go to human rights and international law, my own self, and stay away from, um, and, and, and the policy of the nation state, and try to not personally get so much into the conversation of the word Zionism, although it's very clear that there are many perspectives, and, and I call Israel an ethnocracy, that's, that's the word I use. Um, an ethnocracy, yes. which is, yes. in a way, saying that Zionism is an ethnocracy. That part of Zionism is, is an ethnocracy, and meaning that privileges are based on your Jewish identity. So, so my, I would yeah. love to, because yeah. yeah, so, so um, I mean, I I can make an argument why I yeah, think yeah, it's yeah. important to confront Zionism, and I, I had I a whole workshop on it, and I and I don't think there's any reason to avoid it. It's an actual yeah. historical political movement, and it's actually what our opposition is calling themselves and who they are. And if we're not able to name them or identify them, I think we're going to have a hard time defending ourselves or saying why is the Jewish Community Relations Council attacking this campaign or this organization, it's because the Jewish Community Relations Council is not a Jewish community organization. It's an organization that exists to defend the state of Israel and it is based on the ideology of Zionism. So there's different approaches and this workshop isn't about that. So I, I, what I'd like to be able to do if there's not specific questions about this boycott, is kind of get into a different example and a framework and also approach to backlash based on another experience. I have a question, actually. Yeah. Yeah. We are here from Monique and we are in the park, you know, and we voted we voted for the boycott. But I like to hear an explanation about this exaggerated reaction from the Jewish community, I mean, here against this resolution. I mean, why did they rise up in mass, strong opposition? I mean, what, I mean, how do you explain that? Would it be much, so much easier for them if they just ignored it and let it go? Yeah. I mean, I mean, like, why do they always, I mean, when I say they, uh, I meant the Jewish community, and it seems to be kind of like a common reaction across the United States. Mm -hmm. They rise in mass, mm -hmm. and so many people, like, they wrote to the, you know, like, they wrote to the newspaper, say, we are, we are going to stop going to the co-op, we are going to buy that, and we are not going to buy anything from the co-op. I mean, it's, it's, it, it would have been so much easier for them if they, you know, if they ignored it. I mean, what, what do you think? I mean, how do you explain this reaction? I mean, I, let's just, maybe we can respond to this question and then we can give another example so we have a little bit more to work with. Um, I think my response to that is Zionism, so I, I think maybe you should give your response. And then I, <laughs> I would agree. I think that, um, that, um, 1948, Jews secured a state with military power on the basis of an ideology of Zionism and in the background of um, genocide. And therefore took, took the position, so it's both, it is political and it's also psychological, mm -hmm. um, that genocide taught that you can't trust the world to protect Jews, and therefore, the Jewish community needs Israel to be as strong as possible militarily, and that um, therefore, uh, and to do what, whatever it takes because no one will save us, mm -hmm. and two, that um, Israel positions itself as a safe haven for Jews. It's actually one of the more dangerous places for Jewish people to live, but um, but Israel posi positions itself as the last fortress for the Jewish people, and therefore any attack on Israel is 
equivalent to an attack on the Jewish people. And therefore, these things are conflated so that attack here on Israel over there is the same in their minds. That it, and because of the Holocaust, there was a whole uh, methodology of um, confronting anti-Semitism before it ever got started, as it were, and also to point it out, as it were, every time it pops up its head. And, and because Israel um, is now the fourth largest military power in the world, is deeply embedded in the homeland security industry, um, is so, and, and there are so many corporations that are involved in, in uh, the money of, of Israel, it now has positioned itself as a state to, to give directives to the Jewish community through the consulate in particular so that the Jewish, uh, the Jewish leadership Jewish le gets their instructions of how to respond to anything from um, Israel, actually. So, uh, so when you think you're you know, you're doing something very local, all of a sudden you realize you have the entire machine of, of state politics. And you know, the Congress is so heavily invested in the military industrial complex that uh, you, you have to really take a different kind of approach. But that's why the Jewish community always gets involved because mm -hmm. of uh, the way history has unfolded in the last 60 years. Genocide, that it became um, uh, something that was uh, prescribed to by many more Jews, and it's also something that then gets manipulated and used. So it's, in a sense, all of the support that other nation states gives, gives, gives to Israel, Europe, the United States, supposedly because of their recognition of the history that they participated in, the, the persecution of Jews, actually is a, is a message that we actually think you need an, a separate nation state in order to be safe. What kind of a message is that? So I'm gonna start, that's a good segue into, um, I'm gonna do a brief presentation on a different example of backlash and say a little bit about the framework that um, the organization I work with, the International Jewish Anti-Zionist Network, uses when we're asked to come in and defend organizations experiencing backlash. So it is one of the roles that our organization plays and we play it um, uh, in two ways. One is, as a Jewish organization, we intimately understand the psychology Lynn was describing, and um, we can play a useful and strategic as well as informed role in organizing responses. Mm -hmm. But the second is, we actually oppose it. We actually oppose it because it's actually a dishonor to the actual history of anti-Semitism and Jewish persecution. And it's also, um, it also, uh, in our, in our um, understanding of history, Zionism actually comes out of and just continues histories of racism, violence, colonization, ethnic cleansing that actually we don't want a continuation of, we want a departure from. And for us, the, the very notion when, when we get accused of being self-hating or we hear other people being accused of anti-Semitism, um, and Lynn spoke to this, what as a movement we'd like to see all of us move towards is standing on our principles of anti-racism, which of course includes being very careful that we don't make, don't allow the ways in which Israel claims to speak for all Jews. We don't participate in that by also accepting that when you criticize Israel, you're, you're criticizing Jews. Israel is a nation state and Jews are 
depending on definition, a people or participate in a religion or have different um, socio-cultural legacies. It is also true that because of history and the ways in the, that Lynn described, many Jewish people, particularly in the United States, also identify with Israel and react to um, criticisms of Israel in the ways you've described. But it's also true that there has always been, um, and there's many examples in this room, that there has always been Jewish opposition to the state of Israel and to Zionism that created the state of Israel. And so um, in our work, um, it's important to go back to the principles that actually this is a struggle against oppression, this is a struggle against justice, it is not a conflict between two sides, it's neither a religious con um, conflict or even a conflict between, between two nation states. Palestine is an occupied territory um, and there is no Palestinian state at the moment. Um, and that there is one side, which is the side of justice, and what feels very important as a strategy is that all of us feel very comfortable saying why this is important to us. Mm -hmm. And our hope is that that also includes an honoring of the Jewish history of persecution, which in fact the state of Israel um, doesn't address, both on practical terms in terms of safety, but also because its message is that Jews are not safe in the places that we live. Mm. And that is not a message that we agree with. We want everyone to be safe in the places that they live. Mm. And there's nothing exceptional about the need for safety that Jews face. People all over the world face a lack of safety. And in this country, in this moment, as Lynn said, there is absolutely no state force or mass force that is targeting Jews. In this country, who continues to be targeted are Muslim communities, Arab communities, African Americans, working class people. There are a lot of people who are in daily fights for survival in this country. And at, that, at the moment, that does not include Jews in this country. Um, which doesn't mean that you need to deny thousands of years of Jewish persecution to take a stance against, Palestine, you know, um, against Israel or in support of Palestine. You, th that is true and what's happening in Palestine is happening now. So that's sort of the framework and some of the content pieces. Or do you If I can finish the case study, that's great. Um, if you, do you want to throw something into what I, to add to what I was saying? I, I wanted to just say a word about Holocaust survivors. Um, and this is from Albuquerque. Um, we created a klezmer band and a a cafe called Anne Frank Cafe, in response to survivors in our community who were only being trotted out, really, mm -hmm. um, on Yom HaShoah Day. Mm -hmm. And you the rest of the is. year, I, I'm oh sorry, God. I'm sorry, thank you, uh, only taken out on Holocaust Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we realized is that Holocaust memorials completely ignore the Sephardic community. Yeah. And the Mizrahi community, the, the, the Jews of North Africa, uh, Jews of, um, in, in uh, Greece and, and in the lower parts of Europe. Um, so we also, in, in looking at the Holocaust, this framework also means that we're looking at the Holocaust very differently also. Mm -hmm. We're not looking at it only through a white Ashkenazi lens or only through victimization. We all wanted to go back before that history and revalue the beauty of the Jewish community in Europe, in, in Greece, in Northern Africa, etc. That history is so overshadowed by um, Holocaust memorial and victimization mm -hmm. that we felt we had to reframe that as well. Um, and that, that created many interesting alliances for us, which uh, is, is, you know, sort of another story. Um, and we, I also just want to mention, partly in response to you, that um, in talking to Jews of Mizrahi descent, <coughs> African descent, Ethiopian, uh, Jews from the Ethiopian community, what sort of anti-Semitism in the Holocaust Misuse, misuse of those mm -hmm. is to erase 
the vitality and, and uh, long history of those communities in their place. Mm -hmm. And to also to ignore the way that Israel kind of whitewashes mm -hmm. the history of those communities as well. Mm -hmm. And it diminishes the legacy of Judaism as well. It's yeah. mm -hmm. 60 years old, right. 70 years old. You know, it's right. Stupid. Right. And so what Israel and Zionism have done is they take those histories and then they retell them to naturally lead to the creation of a state. And then, of course, they were very involved in the displacement of Jews from the region and then in invisibilizing those histories because the major divide is Arab Jewish. So the fact that there's people whose histories are actually both makes that a much more difficult, easy separation. So um, there's there's lots of reasons for that. And then also, um, you know, the white Jewish community is practices white racism like any white community. Mm -hmm. And so um, and then we have to be careful not to practice that by equating. Jew Jewishness, <coughs> European Jewish traditions, or white Jews, Jews are also a very, di very diverse ethnically and culturally. Um, so, and that's actually part of the, the, the example I'm going to give. Um, uh, IJAM gets called in uh, at two levels. I mean, one, so one resource just to build off of what Lynn spoke about, there's a website called neveragainforanyone.com. And that was part of a tour to challenge the misuse of the Nazi genocide by Israel and Zionism. And Dr. Hayo Meyer, who's a survivor of Auschwitz, um, spoke out across this country and across Europe. And there's a very good presentation by him about that and the way in which, um, as Lynn was talking about, the Nazi genocide has become a religion, and then it becomes very difficult to challenge Israel because what keeps getting evoked is this sort of religious sanctity of the Nazi um, genocide of the Holocaust. So that's a resource. Um, so uh, often we will get called in to defend community-based organizations that take a stand on Israel or in solidarity or who sign on to calls for boycott, divest, and sanction. And one of the strategies of Zionist organizations, particularly Jewish organizations who exist for the purposes of supporting Israel, that's what I mean when I say Zionist organizations, um, is uh, to attack people who are who this isn't the full-time work they do, and who do community-based work and are already completely maxed out, um, underfunded, overworked, and um, target their funding. So that the cost of, of supporting the Palestinian struggle and criticizing Israel is the destruction of your organization and a resource that the community needs. So an example of this was, um, we were asked uh, to help develop a strategy and support a community-based arts organization in, or in Oakland, California that organized an event during um, the attack on Gaza. Um, at the same time that Israel was attacking Gaza, a young man was assassinated, literally assassinated, shot in the back of the head um, by the Oakland police force um, at a, a public transportation station in Oakland. Oscar Grant. Oscar Grant was his name, yes. Um, my aunt. Okay, and it's um, this like, um, it was this event to look at state violence from Oakland to Israel, to Palestine. And um, in the audience was someone from the Jewish Community Relations Council, which many of you will know because they are at the forefront of attacking um, efforts for Palestine solidarity and boycott, divestment, sanction. And they um, started to speak to the funders of this organization and demand that this organization issue an apology um, if they keep their funding. And so it was um, using economic coercion to control the political activities and stance of this organization. Um, I'm not going to say the name of the organization because um, that's they don't they don't necessarily want their name out there. But they're a, they're a community based arts organization run for and by a community of color in Oakland. Um, 
So we went in to meet with them, and in terms of the components of organizing a backlash, the first thing we talked about is what are the principles. And I think Lynn spoke to this. It's really important that we're clear about the principles on which we are standing in solidarity with Palestine. And for this organization, um, their principles are that they are um, uh, an organization that really stands on land rights and on indigenous rights and on the rights of um, uh, immigrants. Mm -hmm. And so when we were talking about what, what is important to them in this, it was important that they are able to say, based on our principles, we stand in solidarity with Palestine. And what you're basically asking us to do is act against our principles. Mm -hmm. And that is a serious accusation to make against a foundation if they actually follow the lead of the Jewish Community Relations Council. And it's also a pretty serious charge for the Jewish Community Relations Council around censorship. Mm -hmm. So um, that was important. Another thing that was important is that as a Jewish organization, I mean, A, we're anti-Zionist, but we're, we're also a Jewish organization, and um, that it's not our political principles. So we are not there to get them to defend the political principles on which we want to see the Palestinian struggle fought. We're there to support them in standing on their political principles. And that's really important. It's important in general in terms of solidarity, but as a Jewish organization, one of the things that's happened in this movement is that because it gets framed as a conflict between two people, is that Jewish voices get a lot of privilege as if they should determine the demands of a Palestinian struggle for liberation. Mm -hmm. And so in our work, we're very careful that even though we obviously have very strong opinions, and for ourselves, we confront Zionism and Israel because we don't think it's a good course for history to take. But that's not what we're there to do. We're helping organizations stand on their own principles. So that's important. Whatever the campaign is, whatever the organization, whether it's yours or others, that those principles are clear. Then you're setting goals. What are the goals? For this organization, is their goal to keep their funding? That may then, may or may not include being really public and visible and having a big political battle. Is their goal to actually fight the political battle? Is their goal the safety of their community or the safety of their organization? For this organization, their goal was to be able to maintain their funding, but if it wasn't through that, but not, not at political compromise, and that they wanted to be really public about the economic coercion that they were facing. So then we, you develop a strategy around those goals. If their goal, I, we, we were also called in for a rape crisis center, and they actually wanted to back out of the politics. Mm -hmm. And our job was not to agitate for them to take a stance. Our job was actually to help this rape crisis center that serves women of color in the San Francisco Bay Area be able to continue to do that. And then you can stay in conversation with them about how that relates to their stance on Palestine. But our, our, our job is to help them with their goals. Then thinking about strategy. Um, What's a strategy to achieve those goals? Different examples in this case is that we met with um, another Jewish organization that was pulled in by the Jewish Community Relations Council to play a, a sort of middle person role. Um, and we really challenged them because they consider themselves to be an anti-racist organization, but on, on behalf of the Jewish Community Relations Council, they were going to this organization and saying, look, if you can just issue an apology and then we can put this behind us and um, and so that that organization progressive Jewish Alliance um, does a lot of work on housing rights or anti-racism rights and so uh, we actually met with them and uh, we went in with the organization and what we knew going in is that we wanted to just create a place where this organization can present what it felt like to be economically coerced like that and to be asked to stand against what they're fighting for in their own community. Mm 